Welcome to this month's DICE uh, talk. Unfortunately, Bob, who normally hosts these, can't be here tonight. He's off doing important discussions about woodlands and trees. Uh, so you're stuck with us tonight. But we are really lucky because we've got three of our amazing master students who are going to be discussing uh, their dissertation research. Um, they've kindly offered slash being coerced, I think, into, uh, <laughs> into the sentence. Stuff. But um, so we've got three talks, I think. What would be best if we do the three presentations and then we have a question and answer session at the end and we know how much time we've got. So if you have questions throughout the talks, make a mental note, write them down, and then at the end we'll um, get everyone up again and have a, a discussion. That's all right with you. Okay, so first up we've got Alicia. Right, uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I think most of you do though, I'm Alicia and I'm on the conservation project pathway um, and I'll be talking to you today about priorities and preferences of the younger generation in Scotland for um, the future of wildlife conservation up there. So just as a bit of a background, um, Scotland ranked 212 out of 240 on the last biodiversity and happiness index, um, possibly even worse than that, that was the best performing of any UK nation. Um, optimistically though, they are doing a lot of conservation work up there at the moment. Um, those range from fairly benign invertebrate reintroductions through to conserving national iconic flagship species, through to the slightly more contentious um, projects, things like possible reintroduction of lynx, um, and there was the historical sea eagle, which was also a little bit contentious. Um, they are doing a lot of stakeholder consultation up there, which is great um, and really good engagement with people who've got professional interests. Um, but reading through the consultations, this one by Gavin McPherson is the only one I managed to come across that included the younger generation. Um, and that was just 12 people from a young farmers group. So whilst not wanting to devalue what they did at all, 12 young farmers is hardly representative of the young generation as a whole. Um, Consultations with the younger generation are happening in other countries um, and they're showing that there are differences in attitudes between the generations. Um, this study was also quite interesting, particularly from a, a Scottish point of view. What that showed was that where the space was opened up for two-way dialogue between the generations, the quite ingrained hostilities held by the adult generation um, were neutralised almost by the younger generation. The, the adults took on board what the younger generation had to say. So pre, they were quite anti and post, they were actually persuaded to move away from persecution from the animals that had been before. Um, the other reason why this is a problem is we, also, we know that the younger generation is increasingly disconnected from nature um, and things like the concept of flagship species, if we can find a taxa or an approach that really appeals to them, try and get people back on board with conservation. For Scotland, um, at the moment, the younger generation, it's one in five, so it's not an insignificant proportion of the population up there. So that led me to generate these three research questions. Actually, how aware are they of what's going on around them, um, wildlife-wise? Secondly, what are those priorities that we could use to excite and engage them? And um, would they want to be involved in consultations, quite apart from anything else? So the way I did this was an online survey that was emailed to schools and then schools distributed it on. Um, I chose every single school in three local authority areas in Scotland that I perceived were most likely to be impacted by these projects or that had been impacted by them. Um, and I chose every school that had a provision for 13 to 18 year olds just to increase representativeness. It was available for three weeks and that included a week after the exam period had finished. <coughs> So onto the findings, just how aware are they? Um, I try to be really helpful with my questions. Uh, so I did things like they got one point for every um, conservation related activity they were involved in. And that related that ranged from things like volunteering through to just something as simple as watching a nature TV program. Um, and I also asked questions about specific animals. So things like the capercaillie, could they identify from photos which one the capercaillie was? Well, the Kaffir is one of the iconic species in Scotland, so it should have been fairly recognisable. Um, the other two species I put forward were the curlew, which again is subject to quite high profile conservation. So they hopefully would be fairly aware of that. And even if they don't know that it's a Kaffir, they could discount it. Um, and the pheasant, which again, is fairly synonymous game birds shooting. Um, so this median score of 
43% was a little bit lower than I was expecting. To put that in context, the Scottish exam results came out this week. The pass mark for their equivalent of our GCSEs and A-levels was around 80%. So again, this is quite worrying. They don't really know what's going on around them. And sort of highlights that we really need to be giving them more opportunity to learn about local wildlife um, and by that I mean, local, not overseas. And also when we're talking about environmental education, it's wildlife, not just climate change, which seems to be quite a big focus at the moment. So my second question about what their priorities are. Um, again, quite surprising. There was nothing that was particularly overriding as a priority and nothing particularly significant. Not what I was expecting, but on reflection, I think actually this could be more positive. When you're talking about a uh, society that's fairly divided at the moment, the fact that the teenagers don't have any particularly strong feelings towards carnivores, birds, and animals, where I've just said about lynx and sea eagles being contentious. Um, and I've said about the two way dialogue um, between the generations perhaps being a way to neutralise attitudes a bit. This offers hope to Scotland that maybe if we handle projects going forward well, we could at worst keep those neutral attitudes. At best, we could try and have a societal change towards something more, more positive in there. Um, whilst I was looking at the, the teenage generation as a whole, know that from consultations with adults, the other demographic features also play a part in influence and perspective. So I came up with these six predictors. Uh, so school year, environment, um, ecological awareness, the region of Scotland they live in, gender, um, how urban and rural their home environment is, and the average amount of time outdoors they spend. Then on to the stats. <laughs> <laughs> and after all of that, there was um, nothing, the, none of the predictive variables kept on coming up time and again, um, and it was quite a confusing picture. Um, so for some of the, these ones are always significant ones. The ones in bold were significant, overlap was not significant. But within this, um, it was confounded by the fact when you looked at some of these variables by themselves, you'd get an inverse relationship, but when you looked at them in relation together, you get a direct relationship or vice versa. <laughs> um, been trying to look into this a bit more, and I think it's got to do with the, the variables themselves interacting and the fact that any stats model will try to come up with some relationship at some point. Um, Okay. Yeah, um, still working on that one. <laughs> um, moving on to my last research question, what are their views on being included? Whilst there is a slight skew toward this is highly important, moderately important, neutral, moderately unimportant, um, highly unimportant, and I don't know. So there is a slight skew towards the important side, but this is obviously the, the highest one. Not what I was expecting, but it will become clear later. Um, I changed the question slightly. So this is personally contributing rather than the last one, which was the generation as a whole. Whilst twice as many people wanted to contribute as didn't, still overwhelmingly, it was a maybe. Um, so again, back to that. And again, nothing conclusive in there at all. And this time there wasn't even anything significant. Um, You'll be pleased to hear that we now get a little bit lighter in it and those alternative explanations reveal themselves. So this was asking what barriers there were to contributing. This is where it comes be interesting. I don't know how to contribute. I don't know enough about wildlife. I don't think my views will be listened to. Actually, don't think not thinking species reintroduction will affect them and not being interested is right down that slide. Um, so it's not it, my original interpretation that it was a I can't be bothered, I, I don't care. Actually, this isn't starting to make me think I'm disempowered, I don't know how to do it, I'm, I feel disenfranchised, I don't want to look stupid, basically. This question I asked in terms of um, getting involved in consultation. So this is, I don't think there should be any minimum age. This was a specific age under 18, granny and granddad over there is us ancient old babies who are over 18. So over 75% were saying people under 18 should be included. Um, I asked them why, and I was really 
heartened at how insightful their comments were. They were balancing the need to have inclusive conservation with a really good understanding that what we were asking them to consult on has significant impact and you have to have the emotional and intellectual um, ability to do that. Um, and I think this is actually really important because these are the people with the lived experience of being a teenager in today's world. They know what they're capable of doing. They think that they could, but going back to what those barriers were, we're just not giving them the opportunity. They don't know how, they don't think they're gonna be listened to. So the conclusion of it was basically ecological awareness is really low. And that's a worry for engagement with recovery from biodiversity crisis, but also just general environmental care, um, where I've said about uh, so much education on climate change at the moment. If they're not aware of what's going on, they can't help with that recovery from that crisis either. This was also evidence of different attitudes um, between the generations. Um, why that was the case, I, I don't know from this research, but maybe that's something for someone else after me to pick up on, or me to pick up on. Um, it also contributes to the very sparse amount of literature that's available on doing research with the younger generation. Um, I went back and I looked at how much there is, and there's very, very little. Um, so I think where the stats have been so ambiguous there, it would have been very easy for me to say, my stats are shaky at best. My response rate was very, very low. I haven't got anything to contribute here. I've got a room of busy people. I'm not going to waste your time. But that's actually exactly why I'm standing here at the moment. As I said, the amount of published literature out there on how to do research with the young generation is so limited. If I had just sat on my research findings, I would just have been validating what they were saying about no one's listening to me and I haven't got the opportunity. I'd have been doing them a huge disservice. Um, there's a huge perception about problems getting ethical approval and safeguarding concerns doing research with younger people. I'm so grateful to the university. They passed my ethics approval, no questions. I had to get in touch with four local councils, 57 schools. No one at any point raised a flag. If nothing else, I hope this research proves it's possible um, and be brave, publish it. It doesn't matter what the findings are. The, the greater the body of evidence we have, the more we've got to work with. Um, not an Oscar's acceptance speech, so I'm going to go, go over this very, very quickly. Um, but lo lots and lots of thank yous in this. Um, and questions are for later on, but emails on there as well if anyone wants it later. <laughs> Stuff. So yeah, next up we've got Kelvin discussing uh, the success of captive or the brilliant success of captive mild red belly chaps. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first time you've seen the authors, I take you on a journey across the UK to explore how red blue chaps are breeding. So yeah, I'm looking at uh, red blue chaps, trying to compare how breeding success is taking place between captives and wild populations. Uh, I forgot to mention that my major is conservation project management and my supervisor is Jim, who is not here today. So just an overview of how my presentation will be. I'll talk about my introduction, study aims, methodology, importance of study without discussion and conclusion, then time for questions at the end. So in terms of introduction, so red chores belong to the family of COVID, which is a family of crows. Uh, historically, they used to be distributed quite widely across Western and Eastern Europe, uh, across North Africa, and then parts of Asia, but their distribution has actually declined due to many threats, one of them being that of uh, changes in land, uh, land use. So one of the things that has really affected red chops is that their feeding behavior depends largely on landscapes that are managed for agriculture, specifically livestock. So if the, if the land has been abandoned, it actually allows overgrowth, and this no, normally reduces the amount of food because they're insectivorous. Mostly they feed on the uh, insects that are found in the dam. So that has actually affected their distribution. And in terms of, in the UK, actually, they they are rare beds, though on the IUCN 
list they are listed as risk concern, but in the UK, as you can see, are less, less than 450 pairs. If you talk of where we are in Kent, actually, they became extinct about 200 years ago, so they are actually just being introduced. So what's the aim of this study? These are some of the research questions that I have. I'm trying to see if there's any differences between breeding success between captive populations and world population. Particularly, I'll be looking at uh, three captive populations, which are World Wood Trust, Paradise Park, Jersey, and then the world population is Jersey World. And then I also want to see if there's any differences in terms of class sizes between breeding pairs and then also females. But also I want to see if at all there's any relationship between the age of the female as well as uh, breeding success. Uh, I should say I need to give my acknowledgements to, to the following partners, and I'm glad to see that we've got people from Modu Trust who are seated at the back there. So thank you for making it to this evening. Uh, in terms of methodology, the data was collected using Species 3 statistics, which is zoological information for management and software. And then in terms of data analysis, I used R, uh, of which uh, after I tested my data for normality, I found that the data was not normally distributed. So I selected the non-parametric uh, method in this case, which was Cruz Coalis, Man Whitney, and Spearman's correlation. Then in terms of breeding success or fledging success, I use this standard formula by Nice 1967, which is uh, actually the number of um, the number of uh, the number of young that leave the nest over the total number of eggs. Why is this study important? I'll borrow what one of my colleagues said. He said this, it, it's important because it's going to help us acquire another qualification. So in this case, it's leading me towards my MSc qualification. <laughs> then it's also going, I hope it will contribute towards the reintroduction project that I've talked about that uh, the World Wood Trust actually have already embarked on. Then also, I just hope that you can contribute to the knowledge gap in terms of breeding success between world populations and uh, captive populations. Uh, these are just box plots that are showing how my data was actually distributed. As you can see, the first one is showing the class sizes, the second one is showing the height, and then the third one is showing uh, what was pledged. I'm sure you can see that the data was a bit skewed, the reason why I chose the non-parametric test. What are my findings, the complicated stuff? So after doing my analysis, um, I compared Going back to my research questions, I was trying to see if there were significant differences between the four populations. So after doing my analysis using crystal wallace test, I found that there were actually significant differences in terms of breeding, uh, in terms of flight sizes, in terms of fledging and hatching. I found that the four, the four populations actually they differed significantly in terms of flight sizes. So I went on to do a postdoc to see where the differences lie. And then also, I just looked at the captive populations alone, which are Jersey World, uh, Jersey Captive, Paradise Park, and uh, World Wood Trust. So I compared these in terms of flight sizes. So in terms of my study, I was looking at flight sizes, I was looking at uh, fledging, I was also looking at hatching. So I compared height size, uh, flight sizes in terms of um, um, the three captive populations. And in terms of the three captive populations, I found that uh, Hatching was different, but in terms of fledging and uh, um, clutch sizes, there are no significant differences between the three captive populations. So because the three captive populations did not differ in terms of uh, clutch sizes, so I went on now to combine the data for the three captive populations and compare hatching uh, clutch sizes between the captive population and the world population. And what I found was that um, the, clutch, the in terms of clutch sizes, I found that uh, the captive population had higher class sizes compared to the old population. Further on, I think I'll explain what could be the possible reasons why there are differences in the class sizes. But my findings that class sizes was higher in the captive population than the old population is slightly different from what Blanco found in terms of the class sizes. Then I also went on to look at how class sizes, if class sizes differed between uh, individual females as well as between pairs because some pairs were some females were paired with different males in, in certain years. 
So I went on to see if that had an effect. So I found that clyde sizes actually differed significantly between different pairings as well as between individual females. Then I went on further to see if at all um, age, the age of a female had an effect or an impact in terms of uh, breeding, in this case, flight sizes. Um, so what I found was that there were no significant differences in terms of flight size, in terms of hatching, and in terms of fledging. And these findings are slightly different from what Reed et al. found in 2003, because they found that um, uh, flight size and female age they were actually correlated, and that clyde sizes actually improved with female age. So this is something that is exciting and I'm sure I may explain or I hope to explain why there were those differences. So in terms of um, captive, uh, in terms of uh, the age now, I, look, I went on to look at how, how, are, the fem how are the females dif defined in terms of their age. So I found that the, the old female chose had a minimum age of 4.5. Was in terms, was comparing them with the world with the captive population. You find I found that the captive populations are actually much older, almost two times the age of the world populations. So possibly this could also have an effect. So this is just a summary of my findings. So the first, um, the second column shows you the number of females, then the clutch, the total clutches. What, what, how much hatched and then how much fledged. Then I had uh, a mean flight size of 3.5 for JZ captive, 2.7 for JZ world, paradise park at 3.3, and then the world root I had uh, 3.4. But in terms of overall fledging success, I found out that uh, the world population actually had a higher fledging success, which I agree with some of the findings of other authors. Uh, so I went on now to compare my findings and those of other other researchers. So here I was just comparing different popular, different um, uh, authors here, and these are the findings that they they had. Was these are my findings in my in my case? I found that uh, the world with population actually in terms of fledging success it had higher. Coming to my conclusion, I've mentioned that there are quite differences in terms of what I found with other authors. Some, some of my findings agree with other authors. So possible reasons why my findings differ with those, it could be that uh, the world population actually was younger than the captive population. Uh, what I've found from other authors is say that uh, breeding success increased with age, but you can see that the minimum age of the world population was just four was that of captive population was 10. So that could have been a factor in this. Then also uh, the captive population, they've got constant supply of food. So <coughs> supplementary feeding might have an impact as to why class sizes were higher in the captive population compared to the old populations which have to compete for resources, which have to compete for good nesting sites, which have to compete for food. And then there's also a possibility of human error because it is difficult to record the, the clutch sizes in the world population because in some cases like the data that I had they would only find chicks have already had so they would not know the exact number of uh, eggs which were laid so that there is that possibility of human error <laughs> thank you for listening I will value any questions or contributions that would be improve my findings further. I should mention that these are just preliminary findings so far. I'm yet to do JLMs to see more factors that could have that could explain these uh, differences. Thank you.